I'm Pete Fenner and I'm the treasurer for Peoria Audubon. So the topic for tonight's meeting is to welcome uh, black birders and all birders. But uh, I have posted a couple of pictures of blackbirds and uh, on the left is an American coot and on the right is a brewer's blackbird. So, uh, and I've done this throughout the presentation for obvious reasons. Um, but um, we welcome all birders, uh, but uh, in this case, especially black birders. Um, so why do we need to discuss this? And um, I, the answer that I came up with, with is that I don't know any uh, black birder and I have never seen a black person attend a Peoria Audubon meeting or a field trip. And we talked about this as a board and we did come up with uh, a gal, um, Barbara, who uh, is a, a master naturalist. And we talked to her a little bit about and got her ideas. So we've, we've got some input um, uh, from this about this presentation because I don't think we have any black attendees on the line. Um, so the objective of the Peoria Audubon Society is to engage in educational, scientific, literary, historical, and charitable pursuits related to the field of ornithology, which is birds, as well as the maintenance and improvement of the natural environment. Now that statement came from our Peoria Audubon Articles of Incorporation. So listening to that statement, our mission applies to everybody, not just any one individual segment of people. Um, so it does not definitely exclude black birders, but we don't have anybody that ever comes and attends field trips, et cetera. And nor have I really ever seen a black birder out in the field um, looking at birds. Our situation though is not unique. So just for some terminology, and I got some help from Barbara and from Mary Zayner. Um, when we say black, we really mean BIPOC. And here's a new term that I didn't know about, uh, black indigenous people of color. So um, that's really who we're talking about. So it's not just, you know, again, we're not being exclusionary. Uh, we want to include all, we want to be inclusive. Okay, so um, I would like to introduce you to a, a man by the name of Drew Lanham. Uh, he is a professor of uh, um, wildlife ecology at Clemson University in Clemson, South Carolina. And um, I first ran across Drew on a video that, um, that he uh, put out there. Um, he was the, the, the featured speaker of um, a annual meeting of National Audubon a couple of years ago. And his entire speech was posted online. And one of the things he touched on was uh, being a black birder. Um, uh, he talked a lot about individual birds and one of the birds that he talked about and some of the things he studied has been a Swainson's warbler, which is a really tough bird in Illinois to see. Uh, but in Clemson, South Carolina, it's not so hard. Uh, well, it is still hard because it's a tough bird to see, but it, but he is uh, very familiar with it. And he talked a little bit about the Swainson's warbler. So I put the picture of, uh, of, of the Swainson's warbler up there. Uh, all these photos, by the way, are photos I've taken. Uh, and this was taken in Missouri. Uh, but anyway, Drew Lanham is, um, is a pretty well regarded professor and he is obviously a black man. So uh, this is something Drew Lanham wrote uh, last year's Audubon magazine. So if any of you get the Audubon magazine, you may have read this. 
but I'm just going to go ahead and read this. Uh, the founding father of, uh, well, let me start with the title. What do we do about John James Audubon? The founding father of American birding soared on the wings of white privilege. The birding community and organizations that bear his name must grapple with this racist legacy to create a more just, inclusive world. My name is J. Drew Lanham, and I'm a Black American ornithologist, a Black bird watcher. I confess here and declare now multiple identities, race and ethnicity, profession and passion. My love of birds lies at the intersection of these and renders me in the minuscule percentage of others who would declare themselves the same, a rarity. Like the seldom seen skulking sparrows, so many of us seek, we are few and far between among an overwhelmingly white flock. I celebrate who I am, but like far too many of us living while black, I have also felt the frustration and pain of being discounted or disrespected. That's powerful words. Uh, one more page of this. Uh, last summer, the Sierra Club denounced its first president, John Muir, as a racist unworth, unworthy of organizational adulation. Muir is a founding father of the American wilderness movement. He also characterized blacks as lazy. I'm not going to read that word. And Native Americans as dirty. The National Audubon Society followed suit, stating that Audubon too was a racist. He enslaved at least nine people. He mostly referred to them as servants and hands, but never seemed especially concerned that the people helping him could be bought, sold, raped, whipped, or killed on a whim. And again, relatively few men of his time did. Presidents did not. Why would he? Audubon's callous ignorance wouldn't have been unusual for a white man. It would have been de rigueur an expectation of race and class that he enjoyed. Both Muir and Audubon were men of their time and judged accordingly, but could have been men ahead of their time and judged otherwise. The stories of icons and heroes are critical, but what happens when truth rubs the shine off to reveal tarnished reality? As patriarchy privilege and the closely allied sin of racism persist, how many monuments to environmentalism and conservation need to come down, or at least be rigorously inspected. As we consider how we treat past memory, do we need to rethink? Okay, so um, those are some powerful words. And um, really, you know, if you believe in Audubon's mission, uh, ought to make all of us um, think about it. And it certainly has made me think about it. So I have a couple of videos to, uh, to show. These are, are relatively short um, and they both feature doc, uh, Dr. Lana. So I'm gonna start with Birding While Black and hopefully this works fine for everybody. You know, they're essential tools for birding. They're your binoculars, your spotting scope, your field guide. And if you're black, you're gonna need probably two or three forms of ID. Never wear a hoodie, ever. The word for an African-American in camouflage is incognito. Blackbirds are your birds. Red-winged blackbirds, grackles, rusty blackbirds, brewer's blackbirds, black scoters, you claim black brant, crows, ravens, and blackbirds are largely maligned. Any bird that's black is my bird. You know, the edge of day as light is fading. Those crepuscular hours are the times when many birds come to life 
It's such a beautiful time to bird. But if you're a black birder and you're going to bird at night, you better be careful because you might be perceived as being up to no good. Be prepared to be confused with the other black birder. When I meet another black birder, it's like encountering an ivory billed woodpecker, an endangered species, extinction looms. These are the rules for the black birder. We have to do something to make birding, to make nature study in general, more interesting to people of color. Out of every hundred bird watchers, how many are black? Five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drew talked about, um, you know, that just what I said, there are not that many black birders. Uh, there are kind of a rarity. Um, and you have to be very careful as a black birder because people, um, you know, think that you're up to no good or, or might think that you're up to no good. And a couple of the rules that he said were carry ID, a couple forms, uh, and don't wear a hoodie. And, uh, you know, he made it dramatic and took off his, his hoodie and threw it on the seat. Um, he also did a really a wonderful call of a uh, uh, barred owl. It was really uh, outstanding. Anyway, that is, that is Drew Lanham. Um, he is a, a very accomplished professor. He is in great demand now because the environmental organizations are, are waking up to the fact that uh, they were started by white environmentalists who really did not have the, really did not have the uh, best record of, of uh, treatment of minorities. So there's a couple other videos here that that you can watch, um, you know, uh, reflections of a cultural ornithologist. And DeVoe Bank is a place in Georgia or South Carolina where thousands of Wimbrel stop. And Drew Lanham, who is a cultural ecologist, I guess, uh, talks about, um, you know, about birding as it relates to culture, which is a really interesting and different perspective. I surround myself with extinct birds because it's, it's a reminder of what was. I can think about the history of those birds, but I can also connect the history of those birds to my ancestors who worked some of these fields and who helped to build this country as bondaged people who probably looked skyward to see endless flocks of birds that provided inspiration in many ways for liberation. I grew up in a little county in the western Piedmont called Edgefield. Edgefield is nestled against the Savannah River, and I grew up on a family farm. So birds were best friends and, and confidants. Imagine that bird flying through the air for thousands of miles. And as that bird's flying, it's being pulled by memory, by instinct, by stars, by all of the things that we know and many that we don't know that causes it to settle or to go on. That Wimbrel's eye view, that Wimbrel could look down and see DeVoe Bank and recognize that landscape as a safe resting place.
as a place to refuel for the rest of the trip so that it can make more of itself. That, that's an emotional thing to me, and it's something to be proud of. And it's, it's something for us to, to hold on to. It's something for us to fight for. Part of the miracle is that these birds can travel thousands of miles, that they are dodging storms and peregrine falcons and all kinds of things that they've been built for. They've been built for that. What worries me are those factors that they haven't been built for. We think about the past and what must have been of evening skies being darkened by wimbrel and plover and other shorebirds coming in to roost in a place that we marvel over tens of thousands, that at some point in time there were hundreds of thousands and millions, means that we've exacted an enormous toll on our environment. When I think about that bird, all of that time and effort, that evolutionary miracle compressed into that wimbrel, it delivers a different sort of motivation for wanting to conserve. Part of the reason that it's important for me to work for home, for my southern home, is because I believe it has to happen here. I believe recognition, reconciliation, and repair, reparation has to happen here. It has to happen here. The recognition of, of what occurred, that the nation was built on the backs of others and on this, this pain. It wasn't just a Southern thing, but here in South Carolina, it was so evident and it still exists on the landscape the repair comes, the reparations come in seeing, in part, the nature that exists on top of that pain and despair that nature is reclaiming what was torn apart, that the birds are sort of these wonderful messengers that help us resolve to be better that we can gather around those birds and we can say, this is what was, it was terrible. We ought never let that happen again. That instead of seeing brown backs bent over furrows, we can watch the feathered backs of birds probing crabs from burrows. I want us to gather around nature in these ways. If it happens here in the South, then there's hope for everywhere. The disparate histories of, of black and white, of enslaved and, and free, of, of land owner and being bound to land by force, that, that history can't be denied, it can't be shut out. And we can't just watch birds without that history in mind. And so it's important from time to time to take your binoculars down and to see the wider view. The wetlands we conserve, the forests that we conserve, there ought to be a way to inspire people to understand that partnerships with people matter. Culture matters. Those great rice fields and rice marsh in the South Carolina Low Country in the Ace Basin are places of great pain. In some ways now are redeemed as places of great beauty where birds fly free. And so that flyway is tied together, not just in space, but in time. And it's up to us now 
to determine what happens in the future. We have some of that control, and it's our obligation to exercise it. To go from one to a dozen to tens of thousands is jaw-dropping. <coughs> it's overwhelming in the best way because <coughs> I didn't know that that still happened, that that still existed for something like a Wimbrel. Seeing this is like some great discovery. It's, it's sort of almost like a de-extinction. Emily Dickinson talks about hope being the thing with feathers. This is the prime exemplar of that. I don't think there's anybody that doesn't love a beautiful thing. And what those tens of thousands of birds are, you can close your eyes in those calls. And you have to be amazed. You have to be astounded. And you have to be proud to know that that's here. It's not a unique situation. I am often stopped if I'm birding somewhere by somebody, a resident, a somebody driving by. Um, uh, I'm often stopped and asked um, either directly, what are you doing? Uh, or, or indirectly, I'm, I'm sometimes, um, I'm sometimes asked, um, what are you seeing or do you need help? Uh, so, uh, and I, you know, if I say no <laughs> and don't elaborate, then they will come, generally somebody will come out with a follow-up question, what are you doing? And, uh, and then I explain, I'm, I'm looking and counting at counting birds. Uh, and then sometimes people are not that happy about that, uh, even though I'm not trespassing, even though I'm on public roads uh, in public spaces, uh, often people are not happy about that. And if I were an African-American, um, it could be a dangerous situation. And, and the, you know, the recent... Um, there's a recent example of that. There's a man by the name of Christian Cooper who's involved with New York City uh, Audubon. And maybe you remember this incident, but uh, he was birding in Central Park and it's a very environmentally sensitive area. There are signs all over that say, dogs must be on a leash. Just like around here, we have a number of places around here that say dogs must be on leash. And many, many people ignore those signs. Um, if you go to Detweiler, the Riverside area, there are signs all over that say dog must be on a leash. I don't think, uh, 
I have ever seen a dog there that has been on a leash the whole time. Uh, people just totally dis disregard those signs. And there are good reasons from an environmental standpoint, from a habitat standpoint to, to leash your dogs, much less the dogs will jump up on you or who knows whatever they, what else they might do. So Christian Cooper ran into a person in Central Park who did not have their dog on a leash. And he politely asked this person to uh, leash the dog and she refused. Uh, and uh, got rather insistent, and he took out his phone and started videoing it. And she called 911 and said that there was a black man threatening her, which he was not doing. He had this all on video, good thing for him. Uh, and the police came, and uh, they fortunately did not arrest Christian, Christian Cooper, but I think they, they gave her some trouble for filing a false uh, claim. Um, so um, let's see here. We're going to turn now to that confrontation that was caught on camera sparking outrage overnight. A white woman calling to police after a black man says he asked her to leash her dog in Central Park. T.J. Holmes joins us with what they're both saying this morning. Good morning, T.J. There's an African-American man threatening my life. Robin, those are the exact words this woman used in a frantic manner on 911. And so much of the outrage you mentioned, Robin, that is there this morning has to do with what many people perceive as her attempt to threaten and weaponize the police against a black man. This on-camera confrontation making headlines overnight. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. You're hearing the voice of 57-year-old Chris Cooper, who says his request for this woman to keep her dog on a leash quickly escalated. Can I take any pictures of calling the cops? Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Once she's on the phone with 911, you can hear her tone change. There is an African-American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. Cooper says he was bird watching in Central Park just after 8 a.m. on Monday when he came across the woman with her dog unleashed against park rules. Well, I said to the young woman, I said, dogs in the ramble have to be on the leash at all times. Cooper claims she refused. That's when he says he used treats to try to lure the dog away from some plant beds just before he began recording. They don't like it when you feed their dog treats. And she didn't like that at all. And she immediately grabbed the dog, as you can see from the video, and started hauling it around by its collar. New York police confirm officers did respond to a reported assault, but says there were no arrest or summons issued for what they described as a verbal dispute. Speaking to a local New York station, the woman in the video apologized to Cooper, saying it was unacceptable, and I humbly and fully apologize to everyone who's seen that video, everyone that's been offended, everyone who thinks of me in a lower light, and I understand why they do. Adding that she was fearful because she says before the video began, Cooper had been yelling and offering her dog unknown items. The video quickly taking over Twitter's trending topics with more than 130,000 tweets, many calling for the woman to be fired. And overnight, her employer announced on Twitter that she will be placed on administrative leave pending investigation, adding, we take these matters very seriously and we do not condone racism of any kind. And the dog in that video, the woman has now returned it to the rescue where she got it. A lot of people pointed out her treatment of the dog in that video, and the rescue says it's now in their possession and in good health. And Robin, of course, after incidents in the past, we've seen hashtags driving while black, walking while black, sleeping while black. Well, yes, bird watching while black is now a topic being talked on, mm. about on Twitter. Yes, and it was. It was bandied about on Twitter, and it was just a reaction from people in seeing it. But she has apologized. But still, I, I don't think people realize the, the harm that could have come from her making that call to police, TJ. If he had not taken that video, would he have been arrested? Again, you have police coming to a scene where you think something violent, an assault is taking place. And again, so many of the videos we've seen in this day and age about incidents with police and black men, it's just this could have escalated in a different way, Robin. 
and we're glad that it did not. Okay, TJ, thank you. Basically, that's what happened um, in Central Park. Uh, and Christian Cooper is a, uh, you know, is a very credible person and uh, a very good birder. And, you know, he could have been, you know, really at risk had he not been videotaping uh, this incident. So this is also a photo of Walter Kitundu. And Walter is a Chicago artist and birder, and he is a, um, a man of color. And uh, he has had issues similar to this. And um, he is often out uh, photographing birds in Chicago. And he is so often um, accosted by people wondering what they're doing. You know, if you're in a neighborhood and you're really any color, but it's worse if you're a black person and you're looking <laughs> through binoculars, uh, you're going to arouse suspicion. So he created this advisory, this poster, and he started putting it up. Have you seen this man? And has a picture of him. He's a black man and also a photographer. While this combination may be rare, rest assured, it is generally not considered dangerous. Having these characteristics does not automatically qualify him as suspicious. Granted, he does often stand still for long periods near bushes and exhibit short, short bursts of speed in pursuit of a good image. Be aware that overall, he finds the birds in the park much more interesting than the people striding through it. And his camera is not trained on you. He will not harm your dogs, children, sisters, mothers, brothers, or friends. He may even offer you help when needed or a smile, a chance to see a close-up of a hawk or hummingbird. Do not call the police unless you see him being accosted by another party. Do not flag down a patrol car. Save your fear for something that counts and have a lovely day. And then he posted a bunch of pictures on his poster. Okay, he's being humorous here. Uh, and you, you do wish it were all a humorous situation, but he would not have done this if, um, uh, if it wasn't a serious situation. And having, uh, you know, my experience, and maybe some of you have also experienced this, have had people stop you and, and wonder what you're doing or, or just ask you, you know, really to leave or, or something, even though you're doing absolutely nothing wrong. People don't understand generally somebody who's just standing there uh, looking at birds. They, they are uh, too suspicious generally. And it's worse again for a, a black birder. So um, Karina Newsom, who is a, a young gal, a uh, young black gal, she and a few others uh, created Black Birders Week. And Black Birders Week starts the last week of this month. And uh, it's been going on now for a couple, three years. And uh, it is about welcoming uh, Black birders and other birders of color in, into uh, birding and inviting them into birding. So um, this particular Maybe we'll try this one and see if it works. And um... For far too long, black people in the United States have been shown that outdoor exploration activities such as birding are not for us. Whether it be because of the way the media chooses to present who is the outdoorsy type or the racism experienced by black people when we do explore the outdoors as we saw recently in Central Park. Well, we've decided to change that narrative. A group of black birders, explorers, and scientists got together to start the first ever Black yeah. Birders Week, which will start this Sunday, May 31st. Every day will have its own hashtag associated with a specific online engagement or event, and we want everyone to join in. Help us to show the world, especially the next generation of young black birders and nature enthusiasts, that we exist, that they are welcome, and that this space belongs to them too. Uh, she is a, obviously a young gal. She is a um, graduate student uh, somewhere in Georgia, I forget where. And she has, she is being credited with um, 
starting or certainly helping to start Blackbirders Week. And uh, it's been adopted by a number of Audubon uh, and other environmental uh, chapters. Okay, so just some discussion questions. What can Peoria Audubon do and how can we make positive progress? Is there anything that you individually can do to help Blackbirders feel welcome? And then how can we help create more Black, Indigenous, people of color birders? So one of the things that uh, I've already done, and I haven't made a tremendous amount of progress on this yet, but I've been in touch with the Carver Center and waiting to hear back from them. Uh, I have some, some binoculars that I'm wanting to donate um, and I'm wanting them to go to black youth that have an interest in birding or nature. And um, so that's what, uh, so I have these binoculars and that is the intent, uh, if I can make this happen uh, on behalf of Peoria Audubon. So that's one of the things I can think of that we can do. Certainly, you know, just kind of spreading this news and spreading this uh, information is, uh, is another thing. So I'm open and um, interested in uh, your feedback uh, now. And, uh, you know, if you've had time to think about it uh, in the future and have more feedback uh, in the future, you're certainly welcome to uh, uh, to Steve, provide. Is your, is your email address or something on the presentation somewhere so that people could get in contact with you, or or how should they go about that? Yep. Um, so I think if you know my email is treasurer at peoriaaudubon.org, uh, and those emails are on our website, uh, peoriaaudubon.org. So um, that, is, um, that is how I would suggest you can do that. I'm gonna unmute everybody so that they can talk. Good, thank you, Steve. Let me see if I can go. <laughs> Looks like I can't, I, I'm just gonna ask everybody to unmute and, and provide any commentary. I, I, the person that, that uh, Pete was talking about before that gave us some ideas was, was saying it's important to reach youth. So anybody that has contacts with, um, with organizations within schools that, that are racially diverse, that would have science clubs or that sort of thing that would like to have any input from, from a Peoria Audubon member, making sure they're aware of, of things that are going on, that, that, that would be another <coughs> thing that youth yourself personally or others would have, have input into those areas. That would be one thing that she brought up. Uh, oh, go ahead. One thing that I, this is Dave. I mean, on some of these, some people live in areas of the city where there's just not a lot of birds. Uh, how do we get them interested in that if they don't see much in the way of birds in their every day? Yeah, um, that is true. There are more birds um, in some places than others, uh, but really birds are everywhere. Right. And, and uh, I, you know, one of the uh, more interesting places in the south part of Peoria, for instance, is uh, Lutheran Cemetery. Ah, mm -hmm. It's a fantastic place for birds. I go there uh, uh, often. Hmm. Okay. Um, and it's in kind of the south part of Peoria in a very uh, racially, I think more racially diverse than, than other areas. Uh, but really there are birds everywhere. Um, and uh, go ahead, Steve, you have a comment. Yeah, but to the point there, we might want to, we take, we're taking notes here. <laughs> yeah. Might want to as a, as Peoria Audubon, as we, I mean, we've kind of not done as many outings uh, in the past couple of years that we have done before but we might want to have an outing in a location like that in South Peoria yeah. or something like yeah. that versus yep. we normally have them at, you know, up at, uh, my mind, my slipping the Tawny Oaks and that sort of stuff that is their prairie. So that's a good point that we might want to specifically target an area that 
that is more yeah. towards South Peoria. Yes, good point. Thank you, Dave. What about uh, uh, Springdale? I bet you there's a lot of birds there too. Yeah, there are. Indeed, that is a really, really good birding spot. Definitely That's a beautiful place. I I love just walking there. You know. Yeah. Uh, cemeteries often are <laughs> and let, yeah, sometimes people are are you know scared of going to the cemetery but uh yeah they're gorgeous uh, gorgeous trees um uh, there's a nice uh prairie in at springdale um yeah lots of birds there even downtown along the riverfront uh, especially around riverplex mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. yep yep very good point there steve riverplex is a great birding spot Right downtown. Yeah. Really anything along the river is right. going to be really good. Yeah, there's an area. Uh, there's a there's a marina there or something, but just north of that, there's a little peninsula that goes out into the river that is a nice spot too. Uh, near Detweiler Marina, I think you're talking about, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Very I, good. I'm, I'm going to. Uh, Let's see, it's next, uh, I think it's, well, the third Wednesday, which would be next week. Uh, I'm leading a um, hike from my, I'm a member of the Sierra Club and gonna lead a walk along the, the river starting at 545, meeting at uh, uh, the Gateway Building, so. Good. That's a good idea, which I'll take along my binoculars. And good, yes. you'll. Uh, birds are are uh, very busy right now because of migration. So, um, um, at least right now, anyway, uh, you would see a lot. You would see or hear a lot of birds. Right. Oh, I just thought of this. Binoculars or you people of either sex can use binoculars. True. Binoculars. Uh huh. <laughs> They're true. Oh. Okay, I put uh, pictures of uh, birds that are black and white. And, um, you know, they're really very gorgeous birds. Uh, at least I think so. Um, you know, the black turnstone, this is not a bird that you find around here. It's a, it's a coastal, uh, mostly West Coast bird, but, but you do see black neck stilts around here. Uh, along the river and uh, down near Amaquan and then bobolink. So some of the, um, some of the most handsome birds that uh, we have are black and white. <clears throat> yeah. So just a little subliminal message there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and the same, the same here, uh, the Eastern Kingbird uh, that they've just come back in the last week or so, uh, black crowned night heron. Mm -hmm. I'm still wanting to see them, one of them for this year and uh, black pole warbler. So, um, Bill, uh, uh, if anybody has any other comments, I uh, welcome them. Otherwise, then I hope this discussion will continue. Uh, this issue has really persisted for a hundred or more years, mm -hmm. uh, but we're just now, you know, kind of waking up to this mm -hmm. fact. Uh, you can also get a hold of us through our Facebook group and our Facebook page, and uh, you can uh, stay uh, in touch with the presentations that we have had during the pandemic on our YouTube channel. They have been posted there. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, the actions and attitude of people like John Muir, John James Audubon, uh, towards people of color were certainly despicable and, and bad. But they did contribute a lot to, you know, appreciating nature and the environment, et cetera. Is it possible to, to you know, condemn them for the bad stuff, but yet recognize the good stuff? What yeah, I, think, I think that that is where we are. Uh, that there has been a lot of good that has come from these organizations, uh, but in order to improve and move forward, this is a tremendous opportunity mm -hmm. uh, because 
if you just look at the membership, we have been not necessarily on purpose, but we have been exclusionary. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, I think you're right. There has been some really good uh, environmental um, um, uh, scientific uh, progress through organizations like Audubon and um, and Sierra Club. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but you know, this is a great opportunity for for organizations like us to improve and be more inclusive and less exclusionary. I guess that's how I would put it. Yeah, uh, I think the local Sierra Club were wanting to do the same thing, yeah. Yeah, good. I had not heard that, that's really good news. Hey Pete, uh, I don't want to shut off the conversation on this one, but is there any other Audubon business that, you know, looking forward to the fall that we want to bring up? I think, is this our last meeting of the summer? Yes, this is our last meeting uh, until September. The second Wednesday of September, we will uh, start again with regular membership meetings. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll have them the second uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, in September, October, November, and December. Okay. Um, and uh, you'll just need to stay in touch with uh, our website or um, our Facebook page to know who's uh, who is presenting and, and what our, our meeting topic will be. We have okay. a few things lined up. And it I may be, have a slide more, we may be moving back or at least offering an in-person option to, depending on, again, we're, we're watching the COVID situation and the community sorts of stuff and being cautious about that. 